Good evening, everybody. I'm going to do a uh, Sky This Month uh, spritzer edition, a fun and frothy summer edition, a little bit lighter than our normal detailed uh, deep dive. So I'm covering the, the month from tonight through August 19th, or less. And um, I'm going to kick off in a minute here with a look at the comet, what it's up to. But first, I just want to mention a couple of space exploration things to be on the lookout for. Uh, first up is that the Emirates are launching a mission to Mars. That launch is scheduled for tomorrow at 4.43 uh, p.m. Eastern Time uh, out of Japan. And then uh, on July 30th, NASA expects to launch their Mars Perseverance rover. That's the Mars, formerly known as the Mars 2020 rover. It's about the same size and shape as the Curiosity rover on Mars, the nuclear-powered rover. But this one is going to be uh, more of a robot biologist, and it's more a mission to search for signs of life or past, past present life on Mars. And that's, as I said, July 30th. The window for that one opens about 7.50 a.m., so you may want to keep your eye on the news about that one. Um, so this time of the year, we're still dealing with uh, fairly short nights, but the sun is setting a little bit earlier every day now. Um, we're actually gaining about a minute and a half of night darkness every day at this point in, this, in, the, uh, in the year. And um, astronomical twilight is the uh, phenomenon when the sun is lower than uh, 18 degrees below the horizon, and we consider the sky to be fully dark at that point. And right about now, astronomical twilight ends and the sky gets its maximum darkness at about 11 o'clock. And then it starts getting light again around 3.30 and 3.40 in the morning. So that gives us about four hours and 40 minutes if you're an imager and you want a nice black dark sky without, without you know, the moon go, gone from the picture. By our next meeting on August 19th, uh, astronomical twilight will end earlier at 10 o'clock and resume at 4.40. So we've actually gained two hours of dark sky in the next month. So that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. All right. So I'm going to use Stellarium here to, to give a sense of what's up with Comet Neowise. So I highly recommend if you want to see the comet, you need to find a location with a nice low and open northwestern horizon in the evening or a low and open north, northeastern horizon in the pre-dawn. I'm going to focus for the moment on the, on the evening sky. So um, we've been out to look at the comet, a number of us, and uh, we could pick it up in binoculars starting around 9.45. The sky is starting to get dark enough to um, reveal it. And by 10 o'clock, it's becoming a naked eye object. So here's, here's the area of sky we're talking about. I'm just going to advance the time in Stellarium here to about 9.45 or so. So you can see Comet Neowise here. It's actually sitting in the sky, uh, almost directly below the, the Big Dipper. It's actually moving in a north uh, easterly direction, uh, easterly direction. So that northern component of that motion is making it become a circumpolar object, which means that over the next number of days, it will actually not set at all, but it will skim the northern horizon in the middle of the night and then come up before the dawn again. So this is the sky shown for the Toronto area. And if I advance the, uh, the time from 9.50 p.m., 10.50, and by 11.50, by midnight, it's obviously far too low to, to observe. But by the time we get to about almost 4 a.m., we're getting to a point where it's, it's rising above the horizon in the northeast. And you've got, in the morning, I think you've got a shorter window of time to see it before the sky begins to get bright again. And you lose it. So I, I highly recommend uh, the evening approach. So let's go back to the evening sky here. So if I set this to 10 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, the height of the comet above the horizon is about 13 degrees. So that would be equivalent to maybe a, a, a large, larger fist than I am, but roughly a bit more than a fist's width held at arm's length with one eye shut and the bottom of your fist on the horizon. So it's, it's quite low. And of course, it's descending and dropping towards the north. You know, we're used to things dropping towards the west, but because it's circumpolar, it's heading the other way. So if you get out there later, you want to be looking more to the right than to the left of what I'm showing here now. Now, the constellation Lynx is not a particularly easy um, tool to help navigate you because it doesn't have a lot of bright stars in it. But the, the two bottom stars of the Big Dipper will be great, a great help. So 
Uh, in tonight's sky, the comet is nearly directly below Doobie, the star Doobie in the uh, bottom of the Big Dipper. And if I show you what it's going to do over the next number of days, you can get a sense of what to, what to expect night by night. So roughly it's going to ascend about a thumb's width in the sky every night and, like, and continuously slide uh, off to the left here. You can see it's getting higher and closer to the Big Dipper. If you go back to the, on the 18th of July, if you could pick up the, uh, the little tow stars of Ursa Major, it'll be flying very close to them. And then a few days after that, it's gonna be sort of in the vicinity of the rear foot of Ursa Major. And this night of July 23rd is about the night when we expect the comet's orbit will carry it closest to the Earth. And that will mean the comet is larger in the sky, but it also means the comet is farther from the sun and is receiving less heating from the sun and therefore it's fading in brightness. So at the moment, the comet is already descending in brightness and eventually it'll sort of drop below the threshold where it's naked eye. And then as it heads into the sort of later summer sky, we'll probably end up chasing it in our telescopes and things like that as it sort of heads up into Coma Berenices area by the end of July and on from there. But there, that'll give you a sense of where to find it this week. And obviously the sooner you can get on look at it, the better because it's still nearer to the sun and still a bit brighter. And we never know if the comet's gonna fizzle out and, uh, and break up and, and the show will be over. So do get out, make an effort to get out and take a look at it. So let me just get on to some other regularly scheduled astronomical events. So the other big news that would normally be taking uh, center stage in this uh, week of the month would be the fact that we've reached uh, the point where, where Jupiter is at opposition. You can see Jupiter is here in the southeastern sky about 10 p.m. And at opposition, let me just bring up my trusty opposition diagram here. So all the planets circle orbit the sun in the same sense and Earth being closer to the sun is on the inside track. And that means that once a year, Earth passes uh, Jupiter and the other planets on the inside track of the orbits. And that means that at that, on that day of the year that the Earth, uh, Earth's distance from that planet is at its minimum. And that will cause that planet to appear brighter It'll cause it to appear uh, larger in telescopes. And if it has moons that we're interested in tracking down, the moons themselves will be a little bit bigger and brighter. So it's really the optimum time to, to chase down and look at the planets. But the thing to bear in mind is that at opposition, both the Earth and the planet, Jupiter or Saturn, whatever, are both traveling parallel to each other. So it's really not necessary for you to get out there and look at it on the night of opposition. It's really just as good for a number of nights on either side, you know, perhaps for even for a week or two, it's gonna be practically the same size and brightness in the sky. The other thing that happens at opposition is that the planet is opposite the sun in the sky. So as the sun sets, that planet rises and that means it's visible all night long. So you have all, all evening uh, to have a look at it. Now it turns out that we have a bit of a traffic jam of planets happening right now and that we have Jupiter, we have Pluto, and we have Saturn all within about six degrees of each other. So Jupiter was at opposition last night. I believe Pluto was opposition is tonight. And again, Pluto being such a dim 14 magnitude, 14th magnitude target is a bit beyond the reach of most amateur telescopes. But if you're gonna see it, this is the, this is the week to see it when we're, we're at its closest and, and brightest, uh, as meager as that might be. And then on Monday, Saturn has its turn to reach opposition. We also have uh, the ast an asteroid Pallas, which should be in the neighborhood as well. Let's see if I can pick up Pallas. Not sure where that is right now, but if you're interested in looking at an asteroid, you can, you can sort of look for that in your um, planetarium software and check that out. All right, what's next? Now, the other great thing that's happening because of Jupiter as being at opposition is that its alignment, the, the, the alignment of its moons uh, towards us and the sun are more face on, which means that we get a nice little set of uh, shadow transits across the face of Ju the disk of Jupiter. And in fact, we even get some double shadow transit events. So let's see if I can pull one up here. 
on the 17th. Uh, let's see, it's on the 16th around this time. So, whoops, let's go back here. So here's, a, here's the first cool one. This is on uh, the night of the 17th, that's Friday night. We have the, the black shadow of Europa transiting across the northern um, uh, part of, uh, of Jupiter, accompanied by the great red spot. So they'll, they'll, they'll go for a, a while. And then, yeah, that's that one. So let's just sort of march through the month here. So that's this week. Uh, let's talk about the moon for a second. So we'll sort of do this chronologically through the month. So we'll find the moon. So what we also have is the moon visiting Venus. That's happening on Friday as well. And uh, this would be an opportunity, in fact, to probably be able to see Venus in the daytime. So this is the pre-dawn sky in the east around 4, 4.20 or 4 in the morning. As we get after sunrise, you can see that the moon and Venus will cross the sky together. Um, the distance between them is about, let's measure this up here. I need my glasses to read it. Four degrees, four degrees, so that's about four finger widths. So that would be put them both within the field of view of binoculars. So in theory, you could later in the morning Train your binoculars, being very careful to avoid the sun, of course, uh, on the moon and look for Venus's bright little speck of light uh, down to the lower right of it. Now, a day or two later, the moon will hop down and, and sort of join Mercury. Mercury is not that favorably uh, visible in the morning right now, but if you get up kind of 5.30ish uh, in the morning and look to the east, you might be able to find the crescent moon first and then look about a palm's width to the right of it to find the little bright dot of Mercury in the sky. Mercury is actually going to reach its greatest elongation on the 22nd of July. So that'll be its greatest distance or greatest angle away from the sun. And that would be its sort of maximum visibility. You can see that Mercury will be best viewed probably in the, in the period just after 5 a.m. if you want to see Mercury around that time. Then on the 24th, we have uh, another uh, shadow transit on Jupiter, again accompanied by the great red spot. On the 27th, we have the first quarter moon. And then on the 28th of July, we pick up the southern delta Aquarids meteor shower. Uh, that meteor shower is a, a modest one. It's 15 to 20 meters per hour. Um, that one's going to have a waxing gibbous moon on the peak. So let's find the moon again here. Just sort of show you what the moon will look like around that time. All right, so we get into the around the 28th. So that's a pretty bright moon that will be sharing the sky for, the, for that particular meteor shower. But that's, that's okay, stay tuned, we've got better news coming. All right, that's the end of July. Let's switch over to August. All right. So on August 1st, let's keep the moon in the view here and, and pop through a couple of nights. So on just before midnight, let's switch off just before midnight. So it's just before midnight on the 1st of August, we've got that monthly visit of the moon with the uh, gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So they'll make a pretty sight, uh, maybe a nice photo op uh, in early evening. And then if you want to, you could also try again, uh, sort of around three in the morning to uh, get them in the Southwest. So they'll make a nice view that night. That's a great one. The full moon will happen on the third. Obviously the moon rises, the full moon rises as the sun sets. So that's sort of uh, giving us our, our poor, poor sky conditions for, uh, for deep sky observing. But as uh, my friend Blake Nancaro likes to uh, mention, 
there are always double stars. You can head out and chase down some double stars. All right. Next night or two later, so let's just advance a few more nights here. The moon is going to visit quite close to Mars. And they'll linger into the daytime sky. So that might be another opportunity to point your telescope at the moon and then slew over and pick up Mars in the daytime. I've done that before. It's really quite cool. Again, be sure to be avoiding the sun at all times when you're using the telescope or binoculars in the daytime. A few days after that, we get into the 11, August 11th, 12th period. And this is when we're getting the period of the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. So the Perseid meteor shower is one of our favorite showers of the year. Often produces bright fireballs, um, persistent trails of, that leave a, a train of smoke that dissipates in the sky for a, for a minute or two after they leave. The shower starts on the 17th of July and runs till about the 26th of August, but of course it ramps up at a peak on the night of, July, of August 11, 12. And the source of the meteors is up here in the constellation of Perseus, and the meteors will appear to be radiating in a direction away from the constellation Perseus. Now, Unfortunately, the last quarter moon is going to be sharing the sky in the pre-dawn. Now, normally we suggest looking for meteors in the pre-dawn because at that time of the day, at that time of the night, the earth, the sky above you is the part of the earth that's plowing directly into the field of debris that's producing the meteors. But because we've got the moon in the morning sky, what we recommend, at least for this year, is just start looking in the evening. So starting after dusk on... Um, on Tuesday night, the 11th, you can start looking for Perseid meteors uh, shooting across the sky um, all, night, all night long. Definitely worth going for. I, I did note that uh, next year, the Perseids will land on a new moon weekend. So that'll be a great, great uh, angle for us. Uh, a couple more things to cover before the, uh, the reporting period is over. On the 13th of August, we've got Venus reaching its greatest elongation from the sun in the eastern morning sky. Uh, Venus will reach a magnitude of minus 4.43. It'll be um, the brightest thing around at that time. Uh, on the 14th of August, we've got another transit of um, a Ganymede shadow across Jupiter with the great red spot accompanying that. That's going to be happening around 10.30 p.m. That's a, a, an excellent, convenient time to catch that. And then on the 15th of August, let me just bring us up to the 15th. Grab Jupiter here. See if we can pick this up around. There is a double shadow event. Uh, this one is happening on the 15th. Let's go back. There we go. So there we have a we have a triple play here. We have uh, both Ganymede's uh, larger shadow, we have Io smaller shadow, and the great red spot, all visible just after midnight. So this is on the, the night of the 14th, but it's after midnight, it's now the 15th. So let me just reinforce that. So the event, the event starts on Friday the 14th and then continues into the post midnight period on the 15th. So you wanna catch that. Uh, and finally we get the, the new moon occurring on the, uh, the week on the night of August 19th. So basically our, our great dark sky observing periods would be from now until July 22nd, which is about two nights after the new moon. And then again on August 11th to the 21st, which is about two nights after the new moon. Um, ISS flyovers. If you're interested in seeing the space station, right now we're entering a period where we're getting a lot of nighttime passes. And what we often recommend people do is navigate over to the website heavensabove.com. You need to make sure that you type in your location in the location window here. Once you've done that, then you can search from a variety of options and usually if you click on the ISS choice, then it will list all the passes of the space station over your location on the given date how bright it will be. And of course, the more negative the number, the brighter the pass will be. It gives you the start time, the mid, the highest point time, and the end time of the pass. Let's see if we can pick up a bright evening pass here. 
Here's a good one on the 24th of July. If you click on the date, it'll bring up a map of the past. It's only, it's only going to be hitting part of the sky until it disappears into the Earth's shadow, but it'll be very, very bright starting at about uh, 1140 p.m. So that sort of, sort of gives you a sense of how to use heavensabove.com. If you advance the right arrow, it gives you the next, the following week. And then the week after that, we run into the end of the period. So the, the ISS flyovers um, come in sort of cycles or waves. And this uh, series of evening visibility passes will end on August 4th. And then there's a big gap. And then they'll come back in the morning sky after that. Um, in terms of what you might want to look at during these dark sky periods, let's just come back to tonight, aside from comets, that is. So you can use Jupiter. Um, I can recommend that if you navigate over to the, um, the RAS Canada web on YouTube channel, uh, Jenna Hines and I did a, um, a tour of the summertime Milky Way video there yesterday and uh, highlighted a number of targets that you might want to look at in the summer Milky Way sky, summer um, southern sky. So in Stellarium here, you can bring up uh, symbols and labels for all the various deep sky objects that are available uh, in the night sky. Um, one of the if you don't have a big telescope or you're just a beginner, um, one of the things we recommend you doing is just get out with your eyes or if you have binoculars and start exploring the Milky Way. The way you can find it is look for the bright star Antares, which is the heart of the scorpion. And you can find the three little dots, three little stars forming the scorpion's claws just to the upper right of that. And then follow the tail down and around to this nice double star named Shaula, and that's coming down. The best time to look at objects is when they're highest in the sky. And when they're highest in the sky is when they're over the southern horizon. If I put up a mark here for the meridian, so you can see that if you can get the objects to be sort of crossing this line, then they'll be, they'll be viewed at their best. And so the, the Scorpion constellation Scorpius is crossing the meridian right now at around uh, 10, 15 PM. Um, so if you find Antares, and put your binoculars on it. You can look just a little bit to its right and pick up a nice bright globular cluster. Let's put, get rid of the symbols for a second. That's Messier 4. So that's a, an easy, very easy one to find. If you head over a little bit to the east here, you can pick up this distinctive asterism of the teapot. It's uh, the constellation of Sagittarius, but the stars resemble a teapot shape. And in Chris, fact, the Chris, do you want to Milky hold Way resembles uh, mist coming up out of the teapot. So just grab your binoculars and, and sort of explore. You're going to pick up some nice open clusters and some knots of nebulosity. And the Milky Way runs all the way up to the eastern sky. You can pick up the big three bright stars of the summer triangle and then follow the Milky Way through the middle of the triangle. And if you've got a dark sky location, see if you can see the dark um, band or the dark zone that uh, cuts through the Milky Way, that's dark opaque dust in the galaxy that splits the Milky Way into more than one zone. So I'll leave it at that. I think that's uh, a fair amount to see and we're going to get some more dark sky coming up in the next little while. So I'll, I'll throw to questions now. Hey Chris, thanks for all that information. Uh, I had a question for you. I wondered if um, uh, I hope I didn't miss it and you already talked about this, but I wondered if you could uh, go to the moon on July tw uh, July 31st, end of the month. Because I sure. think there's a neat pattern that uh, we can see there. And uh, yeah, if you zoom into that a little bit, I think you can see that we've got, oh, not too much. <laughs> um, off to the left there is uh, Jupiter, um, and then further to the left, of course, Saturn, as you pointed out before. And maybe if you uh, advance a day or two, we see how the moon kind of walks through the whole grouping there. So that's going to be kind of a neat, um, I, don't, I don't think that's officially a conjunction, um, but a neat grouping of the moon and Jupiter and Saturn all together. But they're on the 31st, they're in this nearly perfectly straight line. Yeah. 
So yeah, you can, if you want to get a series of photos, photo, you know, take a photo opportunity and try to grab the moon on several nights, you can sort of catch its progress through. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that one out. There, there was a question from Peter. He asked if there are any lunar letter events. Ah, let's just see if I have any noted here. I think there may be in the period. Let's see. It's today. And While Chris is searching for that, primarily we're we're talking about lunar X. It's an X-shaped pattern that appears uh, around first quarter. Uh, and um, uh, it takes takes a I think at least binoculars a small telescope to just see the feature right yeah so um, the next one I have on my schedule Blake is uh, August twenty fifth starting around eight p.m. oh so that's so, that's my talk so we can't talk about yeah. that now you'll pick that up yeah. <laughs> And lunar X is the big one. There are some other letter patterns, but they're they're not quite as obvious or prominent. Yeah, uh, we should um, we could point out this terrific NASA tool for those who are perhaps doing the the Isabel Williams certificate or wanting to get more acquainted with the Moon. If you go to this um, this NASA website, which is the Moon Phase and Libration tool, it lets you actually dial in how the Moon will look on any hour of any day. And so it's, this is set to universal time. So this is now showing you the moon at, uh, at 8 p.m. today's date. And if you click on the frame, it'll download a, a large format GIF or TIFF, I think it's a TIFF, uh, which is annotated with uh, major features labeled. And if you're doing it through a Newtonian telescope, you can scroll down here and do the south up version. And it'll have the labels the right way up, but the moon flipped around for your view through the eyepiece. And so that's a, this is what a, this is a great tool. So what did we say? We said August twenty fifth, twenty five. That'll be the twenty sixth at zero UT. So twenty six update, and there's the lunar X. You should be able to see it. I may have the hour a little off. Let's go one hour later. I can see it just coming in now. I'll go another hour. There you go. You can see the, yeah. the X is right there. Hopefully everybody can see that in the video. And the this is a great, a great tool to, um, to show you how it will look and sort of practice. And the lunar V is uh, just above there, almost dead center. Yeah, the lunar V is up here. And then there's also, let's see, there's a backwards E down there sometimes. Yeah, there's the V. There's an X, there's an L somewhere. I've, um, um, I'll note it in my skylights when I get to it, but I have in the past uh, highlighted the, uh, all the letters you can see. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, is, um, when, when is Uranus reaching opposition? Is it around this time as well? Because uh, is, this, is this a good time to try, this is sort of a challenge exercise to see if you can spot Uranus just with your eye because it's right around the limit of uh, uh, magnitude limit of um, seeing things just just with your eye. So Uranus's opposition isn't until the thirty first of October, uh, and Neptune's is on September eleventh. So okay. It's, it's, I know it, I know they seem like they're in the same patch of the sky, but because these, these closer planets are moving faster, they're not doing the same, the same thing. So yeah, around the time Mars is doing its great show, then um, we can, we can look at Neptune and Uranus as well. Paul, Paul asked if the great red spot is still shrinking. Have you heard anything new? I haven't heard anybody mention it lately, but then we're just, we're just really getting into the time of year where it's um, going to be observed observed by a lot of people in the evening. So um, some of the people that may have not wanted to bother getting it in the middle of the night or in the morning are now going to be looking at it. Maybe they'll report, you know, what they're seeing compared to last year. 
The other, the other thing I didn't mention that's un, a bit unfortunate about these summertime oppositions is that the planets don't get very high in the sky. I mentioned that things look the best when they're highest. And you can see that even when, even when Jupiter culminates or passes the meridian, the green line, around uh, just before midnight in early August, it's really only uh, 23 degrees above the horizon. So it's really not that high. And so we'll be looking through a lot of Earth's atmosphere at it. There'll be a, it'll be a fair, uh, fair bit of blurriness added because of that. But and it looks like what we get. It looks like Stellarium is showing that they're just a titch below the ecliptic too. Yeah. 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 The plant, the planets, of course, don't don't um, don't all follow the exactly on the ecliptic. There's a number of degrees difference on. Them. That's right. Okay. That's uh, all for questions. Thank you.